July 31st, 2011, my grandfather Gary Lenser and I shared an adventure unlike any other that we had experienced. Skydiving was a gift that I had bought him for his 85th birthday, but the true gift was knowing that I had the chance to jump from 13,000 feet with my best friend. My papa's story doesn't start here. His story begins over 60 years ago in Berlin, Germany. Roses I have tattooed on my left arm covers up the number of my concentration camp number from Auschwitz. It wasn't because I was ashamed of having this number, but I was virtually scared of flying back and forth to Europe. I was a teenage rebel. My grandmother said to me, give me all your jackets. We got to sew on the Jewish star. And I said to her, no, grandma, you're not going to sew it on my jackets. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Woolworth and pick up a sheriff's badge. And then I had my grandmother sew on the star on the sheriff's badge. When I left the apartment, I stuck the sheriff badge on my clothes and I was Jewish and when I got down into the street I pulled it off and put it in my pocket and now I was German. My grandfather committed suicide the night before they came to pick them up for the concentration camp. They had received a notice in the mail that on such and such a date they were to be ready with just one suitcase and some clothing to be picked up for resettlement into a different area. From the area where we came from, Berlin, it went straight to Auschwitz. And they cried, and what are you going to do? And I says, well, I don't know exactly, but I'm going to hide in the city of Berlin. I managed to hide in the Berlin, Alexanderplatz, subway station, apartment houses, hallways, department stores, movie theaters during the day. I noticed this one Hitler youth uh, looking at me. He started hollering out, there's a Jew boy, there's a Jew boy. A half a dozen of these Hitler youth started chasing me. I got around the corner from this street and ran right into the arms of a German patrolman, a policeman. He grabbed me by the collar and says, what did you do? I said, nothing. They hollered, hold him, hold him, he's a Jew boy. And he took me to a local police station. He set me by an open window and he says, don't move. I got to talk to my sergeant and see what we're going to do with you. And he went into the next room and I sat by the window and I looked out and I says, gee, that's not too far. They didn't even know I was gone. I don't know when they found out and I ran up the next street and took off. As Hitler's grasp on Germany strengthened, it became increasingly more difficult to survive as a homeless boy in Berlin. After avoiding being arrested for a year, my grandfather was caught and sent to prison. Without any hope of getting out, he was there for over a month until one day he had the chance to face a judge. The judge determined that his sentence was served and on his way out of the courthouse he was grabbed and thrown into a police wagon, once again a prisoner whose only crime was being a Jew. They took us by bus down to a, that outlying train station. They shoved us into cattle cars, about 70, 80 to a car and we, there was only room enough to stand up. You, you couldn't sit down. We wound up in Auschwitz. At that time, I was 15. I had turned 15 before I got to the concentration camp. He spent two years and one month in Monowitz, a labor camp in the outskirts of Auschwitz. There was punishments for no reasons that were done to us. It was a concentration camp. And to remind anybody of that, we were called out at 2 o'clock at night, told to undress, and stood out there naked in the cold weather, 5 degrees below zero, 
and they pulled out water hoses and sprayed us with water and let us stay out there sometimes up to an hour. And I have seen some of the older men that just keeled over and needless to say, some of them never got up no more. By December of 1944, the Russian army began to push back the Nazis. My grandfather and others were relocated in an open cattle car to a camp further from the front lines. This was Buchenwald. This was the worst starvation camp that I've seen. This became a death camp without being death chambers or without poisoning. People actually starved to death. Until this time, I was still close to 100, 110 pounds in weight because of the extra food that I got and so on. But there I went down, my guess is pretty close to 85. After three horrific months in Buchenwald, the Nazi guards asked for volunteers. He was sent with a group to a nearby camp called Speichingen, where he was forced to work on a farm. Although he worked under supervision, it was easier to sneak food while on the farm. But after three months, the Allied forces were getting close. And one day, we heard the fighting in the distance. Instead of leaving us alone, they apparently had orders to march us back towards Buchenwald, towards the camp that we had left. We were marching us under guard. It was snowing, it was cold, and none of us was dressed proper. Whoever was falling out, they counted to 10, and they shot him in the head. And how many times that happened, I don't know, but it happened at least several times that I witnessed. Towards the end of the fourth day, we were going through a country road into an area that had nothing but curves and S-curves. And the moon was practically not there. And I said to myself, if you're gonna go, this is the time to go. I scooted into the woods and ran as far as I still could and still had the strength. I started hearing behind me shooting and hollering and, and I kept running and then I found a burned out farmhouse and I passed out. When he awoke, all was quiet other than the sound of a man moaning. Following the sound, he found a man from the death march that had been shot in the face. He was alive. Together, they walked into the woods in search of food. They came upon a house and met a woman who had already taken in eight men from their group. She fed and took care of them for over a week, when one day, they heard the roar of nearly 100 tanks approaching. Everybody except Hitler knew that the war was lost. So we figured they can't be German tanks. It had to be either English or American, so we decided we can't lose but go down and stand up and give ourselves up. We stood there with our hands up and here comes this column of tanks and the first tank opened up the hatch and the crew got out and jumped down and they surrounded us. They told us they were Americans and they gave us K-rations and cigarettes and candy and this big hunk of man standing on the running board holding on up there and then somebody blowing a siren and I said to myself, oh my God, a giant from heaven come to help us. We figured it had to be a, maybe even a general. He jumped down and all the passengers got out, about six of them, and the whole group come over to us and the one that looked like he was a chief of staff or something, he spoke a broken German and he says, this is General George S. Patton. And the general wants you all to know that he knows exactly what you went through and who you are and what you had to endure. Just yesterday, he liberated Camp Buchenwald. And he wants you to know he is glad that you survived. The generals come forward and saluted us to, and said to each one of us, sort of, Godspeed. That was the only two words he said. I'm very, very grateful and fortunate that uh, 
he was able to survive the Holocaust and I wouldn't be here if, uh, if it wasn't for him. One real special memory that I have of my dad, which it brings tears to my eyes when I think of it, is when Carly, his youngest granddaughter, was born. He just was holding her and he, he said, if Hitler could see me now, holding my eighth grandchild. If my grandpa didn't survive the Holocaust, I wouldn't be here today. I'm really proud of my grandpa for everything that he's done and I'm so happy that we're very close to each other. I achieved something in life that I didn't think I ever would. I wound up with two children, eight grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. In uh, 2005, uh, my grandfather and I went parasailing and that's where we shared this special moment where he told me he wanted to go skydiving. I said, why don't we go skydiving to prove something that we do that too? And I said, well, wait till I'm 85. For someone of 85 years to even think about getting in a plane and jumping 13,000 feet, it was just unbelievable. I think really one of the things that he wanted to show by going skydiving was the fact that he could be young again and all the things that were taken away during his youth, he can relive now. I went skydiving to prove, basically speaking, that Hitler didn't win. My grandfather is my best friend, and I couldn't imagine going skydiving with anybody else but him. Right now I set my eyes on 90. And I might, I might, if I feel as good as I do now, I might do it again. <laughs>